ഹലോലി <laughs> Brothers and sisters, inshallah, what we'll do now is discuss verse number 70 out of this surah. Let's read the verse together. فَلَمَّا جَهَّزَهُمْ بِجَهَازِهِمْ جَعَلَ السِّقَايَ فِي رَحْلِ أَخِي ثُمَّ أَذَّنَ مُؤَذَّنٌ أَيُّهَا الْعِيرُ إِنَّكُمْ لَسَارِقُونَ Where are we now in the story of Yusuf? The boys have come. They brought Binyamin. They're now in the presence of the Aziz. After that, the Aziz took care of them. He provided what they needed. He gave them, he was hospitable to all of them. He also spoke with his brother Binyamin and he mentally prepared him for what was about to happen. There was a plan that was going to take place. What the verse describes is this. It says, when he had furnished them with their provision. So Yusuf alayhi salam has gotten probably his servants. They have taken care of the men and put all of the things that they needed, their belongings on the camels. They're ready to go. Camels or steeds or whatever they have. And now they're ready to go back to their own country. What happened then? It says he placed the drinking cup into his brother's saddle bag. What happened was that they took the cup of the king, the goblet of the king, and they put it inside Binyamin's bag. Now probably he had already, this may be referring to what was mentioned previously in the verse, where he prepared his brother mentally, that look, I have a plan. This is what's, what's going to happen. You're going to seem like a thief. This is the way we can keep you here. If we remember from yesterday's discussion, he asked his brother, he said, do you want to stay here with me? He said, yes, I would love to stay here with you. I haven't seen you in, let's say, 34 years. But as you know, my brothers, they have promised that they're going to bring me back to their father. There's no way they're going to allow me to stay. And he said, don't worry, I have a plan. How can he keep him? The problem was that according to the Egyptian law, he couldn't keep his brother inside Egypt. It didn't work like that. He would have to, without blow, he didn't want to blow his cover either. He doesn't want them to know. The way that God wants this to work out is the entire family comes to Egypt. The entire family ends up on the right path. The boys recognize what they've done wrong. And they see Yusuf alayhi salam in his glory and they realize what they've done wrong, apologize, go back to their father and everything else that God wanted to happen. But this is a little bit intricate now. I want to make this happen without anybody knowing what's happening. It has to, on the outside, seem perfectly natural and normal. Nobody expects anything, nobody, right? So that God tests everybody the way that they're supposed to be. The way that that's going to happen is, first, mentally prepare my brother. Explain to him the situation. Put the cup of the king inside his saddlebag. When I say he mentally prepared him, later on in this verse, in the rest of the story, you don't see anywhere that he starts shouting, Binyamin. No, I've been framed. This isn't my cup. I didn't put it in here. Some, there's a plot, nothing. Completely calm, right? Able to play along and make this happen. So he has, either he does himself or he has his people put the cup in the saddlebag of his brother. Now, there's a couple of questions that we might ask and I feel might be relevant to, for us as mu'mineen. Because what we try and do is always relate these things to the coming of the imam. and see if how this can apply to us so that we are better able to serve the cause. One of the things that might come across as a question is this. If we look at the verse, the second part of the verse is what it says. Then a herald spoke out. So we've understood the first part. He, pl he places the cup inside his thing, but then a herald speaks out. Somebody working for the Aziz says these words. Ayyuhal'ir, O caravan, 
إِنَّكُمْ لَسَارِقُونَ You surely are thieves. Right? And for a couple of reasons, this is a little bit problematic for us. We want to understand what's happening here. So he accuses the entire caravan of being thieves. Is it correct to, to accuse the boys of theft? Because Yusuf is masoom, right? He doesn't commit any sins. Why is it that he accuses this entire caravan of theft? Is that even right? Is that even right? So the first, to answer that first part of the question, this is what we can say. That when a group of people has one individual amongst them, and that individual hasn't separated himself from the group, it's okay to address the group and say that they have the trait of the one person. Okay? So in our particular situation, they weren't all thieves. One of them apparently is a thief. We have to talk about, well, is it okay even to do tohma and to accuse someone? Let's talk about that. But let's start at the first part first. To accuse a group of something or to say a group is a certain way when there's an individual among that group who is like this and hasn't separated himself from the group is something normal. We have examples for this. So the group amongst them is one thief. So to say you people, one of you is a thief and to call everybody a thief in that way that there's something which is missing, somebody amongst you have taken it, that first part is okay. Next one is um, actually accusing the people of theft and saying this about somebody. Okay? Because one of the sins, like, um, let's use this as a reminder, for the month of Ramadan and the month to do is istighfar and ask Allah for mercy, beg Allah for mercy. Um, this one actually is related to a sin that might apply to some of us. Um, one of the things that God doesn't want us to do is to accuse people of things, false accusations, right? So the first part of this answer, is it right to call them thieves? Well, we'll see how it applies in this case, because actually it's one individual, Binyamin. And Binyamin is somebody who's part of the plan. He knows what the bigger picture is. He's okay with him using this term for him. So keep that aside for a second, but let's stop for a second and think. Is it right to accuse people of things? Actually, insulting a believer is one of the major sins. Insulting one of the mu'mini. When we look in that book, The Major Sins of Ayatollah Dasqayb Shirazi, he says, out of the major sins, the one definition for the major sins are these are the sins where Allah has promised the fire. There's some sins that God hasn't promised the fire. You do it, make it stay far. Okay, but there's some sins God, no, I will burn you if you do this. One of them, sin number 43, is insulting another believer. I want to remind us a little bit about how important this sin is. Make sure that we stay away from this terrible, terrible sin. The respect that every believer has, and this applies to all of us now, because we're in a community of believers, there are other mu'mineen who are around us, each one of the mu'mineen is like this. The respect of a mu'min is greater than that of the Kaaba. The respect of a mu'min is greater than that of the Kaaba. We have one hadith that I'm going to recite for you. It says, Hurmatul mu'min al-faqiyah. This is talking about the poor mu'min. So regular mu'min is respect even is greater than the Kaaba according to that hadith. What is it out about a mu'min who's actually faqiyah? Right? Poor. Let's talk about mu'mineen who are somehow not important in society. What about them? What happens if they're disrespected? It says the mu'min, the fakir mu'min, this person has more respect in the eyes of God than the seven heavens, and the seven earth, and the malaika, and the mountains, and what's in the mountains. Right? So insulting a mu'min then becomes very heavy. If you can't insult the Kaaba, you can't disrespect the Kaaba, disrespecting a fellow believer, how heavy is that? I'll read you the hadith. This is hadith Quds. Man ahana abdi al mu'min, whoever insults another believer, God says, insults my believing slave. Whoever insults my believing slave, faqad istakbalani bil muharaba. Allahu Akbar, has come to di directly declare war on me, on God. If somebody insults a mu'min, then actually, 
According to this hadith, they're declaring war on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a sin we really want to avoid. Insulting other mu'mineen. Sometimes needlessly. Sometimes, oh, it's not a big deal. I'll say something. You know, and, and when Imam al-Mahdi returns, the Islamic law will be implemented. There are some sins, if somebody insults a mu'min in this way, meaning they accuse a mu'min of some sins, in an Islamic state, they will lash that person 80 times with a whip. Right? It's not an easy thing. I just insult people. I say things. Right? It's easy. Some of us, we want to make sure, first of all, if we've done this, insulted another mu'min, we want to do istighfar. If we, our parents have done it, maybe they insulted us. Let's forgive our parents. It's the month of Ramadan. We want to be forgiven. If there's somebody who's done wrong to us, they've insulted us, we ask that Allah has forgive, forgives them for doing this sin. If we've done it, obviously, we want to make sure that we have not done this, insulted another mu'min, hurt another mu'min's free feelings, made somebody feel uncomfortable. One of the things we really want to be careful about. Even as a parent, I'm disciplining my children. How do I discipline my children? If I'm talking to my wife, I'm in an argument with my wife. Even my wife insults me or my husband. Do I also return the insult? Something you want to be very careful about. Now, having said that, now, uh, Yusuf السلام, hasn't committed any sin, obviously, he's not soon. What happens is, if there is a person, you're talking about two mu'mineen now, and I'm comfortable with the words that somebody else uses for me. Let's say, for instance, I don't know if you guys do this, but for us in America, if we're playing basketball, for instance, sometimes we'll trash talk amongst the players, the players. But it's a joke for everybody. Nobody's being insulted here. Everybody's enjoying it. It's all fun and games. I don't want to cross this thin line. I cross that to go to the other side of insulting a moment. I have to be really careful about that. But if it's something that we're all comfortable with, it's okay. A husband and wife, they have certain terms for one another. The way they address one another, the way they play around with one another, but they're both comfortable with it. It's not an insult. We're good. Okay? We're good. As long as that's there. So Binyamin, in our story, Binyamin is part of the plan, right? He's already been prepared. He learned in the other ver the other part of the verse, based on that one tafsir, that this is my plan for getting you out. Okay? So to call everybody sadiqun, first of all, it's not everybody, it's one individual. The others, it's normal to say a group of people when one has done this thing, and then through the investigation, it's going to become clear. So, for... Um, uh, Binyamin himself, he has no problem with it. So Yusuf alayhi salam didn't um, make any, didn't have any problem in this way. Now, the next thing that I'd like to do is see if we can get some inspiration from this last part of the verse. Inspiration from the last part of the verse. What happens is you're watching a complicated plan in action. Right. From the time the boys entered and Yusuf recognized who they were, he started to lay out the plan so he can bring these guys in. And brothers and sisters, sometime for us to support Haq, we have to be Mu'mineen and Mu'mina who can plan carefully and execute a plan. Think about things, prioritize, execute a plan, and then come with that plan. Let me read you a hadith from a middle Mu'mineen. And we'll use it, inshallah, to apply it to paving the way for the return of our Imam. What's the hadith say? Careful planning is even more effective than the means that we have at our disposal. To be able to plan carefully, to figure things out, is even more effective than the means we have at our disposal. I'm trying to build up to something now. Okay? So we have to be able to plan carefully for how. Not just, or our lives. We want to correct our lives, we want to fix our lives, we want to enjoy life, we want to get out of debt, for instance, we want to buy a house, we want to arrange our life or deal with our in-laws, anything. We want to be able to be people who plan and who think. Okay? One story. This is from the life of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It's about one of the mu'mineen who was clever like this. Clever like this, and then after that we'll see how, what our main point is today. This mu'min, his name was Naim bin Mas'ud. Naim bin Mas'ud. And he had recently accepted Islam. Where am I taking you guys to? To the Battle of Ahzab. When the enemy had surrounded the Medina, 
So it's Bani Quraysh, the Jews on the inside, they have one part of Medina. Then the tribes have formed a, a coalition and now they've come to eradicate the Islamic State. So this guy Naim bin Mas'ud, he had recently become a Muslim. And he told the Prophet, he said, look, I'm connected with these different groups. Would you like me to do something to kind of get these guys to leave? A clever mu'min, able to plan to serve Haq. Prophet said, why not? Go ahead. So this guy, he first goes to Bani Qurayza. He goes to the Jews. And he tells them, he says, look, your position over here, fighting the Prophet, is very different from everybody else. After he reassures them how much he cares about them and likes them and he's for them, he says, your position is very different from everybody else. You see, if the Meccans leave, the tribes, the other tribes who have come with the Meccans, they leave, they'll go back to their homes, but you guys, you'll be stuck here with the Prophet. Right? Everybody else, if they, let's say the war ends somehow, you're still here. He said, and they were thinking about it, they're like, yeah, you're right. He said, you know what? If they want to fight and attack the Prophet, what you should do is make sure that you have some support. Take some of them, tell them that you want us as surety, as a guarantee, we want you to leave some people with us. And if you leave these people with us, some of your own nobles, I'll know, we'll know as the Yahud, that you're going to fight till the death. Right? Makes sense, right? We're all in it together now. Your, your chieftains are there with us. We're all over and we're going to fight to the death. Okay? So he talked to them. They're like, yeah, that makes sense. Then after that, he goes to Quraysh. He goes to Quraysh and he says that, um, how much, again, explains to them, I'm on your side, I'm a good guy, this thing. Then he says, you know, these Yahud, they're actually, they want to make amends with the Prophet. They feel bad for fighting him. You know what they've decided to do? What did they decide to do? What they're going to do is they're going to take some of your people as hostages and give them to the Prophet. The Prophet will slaughter them and then he will be with you and he will be with them. He'll forgive them for their sins. He said, you, you want proof? Why don't you do this? Today's Friday. Tomorrow's Saturday. Ask them. Let's go to war. We're, tell them. We, Quraysh, are ready to go to war. Ya Ali, we'll go. Not Ya Ali. They're idols. Hubal or whatever. We're ready. We're going to go fight. So he said, you're going to notice these guys give you all kind of excuses. Then after that, if they say that they want hostages, then you know what's up. Then he went to another tribe that was there, Atfar. He spoke to those guys. He told them what he had told them. these guys about the, uh, the Yahud. Be careful. Don't make sure you guys, you don't let anybody slip. You don't do any of these kind of mistakes. This guy really, after that, he wanted to make sure everything was right. He circled back now, and he came amongst the Mu'minin. And he spread the rumor, right, spread rumors about the, amongst the Mu'minin. I'm trying to remember now, which rumor was it that he spread? Did he spread the rumor of there being an attack? I think the rumor he spread was that Bani Qurayza actually want to make amends for what they've done wrong. They want to come back and join the Prophet. So obviously the enemies have spies within the Muslim camp. They go back to the others and they tell them, look, there's something up. So now these guys are hearing this from all over the place. Abu Sufyan decided, you know what, let's just settle this. So he goes over to meet the Bani Qurayza and he says, you know, let's go to war. Let's just end this battle of Ahzab. Let's figure it all out. They said, no, Saturday, this is the Sabbath. We can't go and fight on a Sabbath. In his own mind, oh, those ex they said, you know what? We want, um, we're here by ourselves. Let's say you abandon the battle. We'll be here. We'll be stuck with these guys. You let some of your nobles stay with us. Yeah, oh, really? So what happens then is by the Mu'min being clever, by the Mu'min using those strategies, the Mu'min was able to actually serve the cause effectively. And like the Imam told us, to think carefully. We watch the strategy in Yusuf, how he's gradually, slowly pulling these guys in. Now we have to think, what is our own strategy for the return of the Imam of our time? Okay? Now I want to share some information with you, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, there's a reason why the 12th Imam isn't here yet. There's a reason why the 12th Imam isn't here yet. Actually, when we look at the Ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt, we see that all of the Ahlul Bayt had one mission. Let me read you the Hadith. 
This is from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says, Khalaqani Allah tabarak wa ta'ala wa ahla bayti min noorin wahid. Allah created me and all of my ahlul bayt from one noor. All of us been created from one noor. The mission of our Prophet and the mission of Amirul Mu'mini and the mission of the Lady Fatima and the mission of the Ayyama, all is one mission. All of them were trying to do what Imam Al Mahdi will do. All of the Ayyama, our Prophet, they were all trying to do. What were they all trying to do? Establish God's kingdom on the earth, rid the earth of the Tawahid, right? Establish the Islamic government, the government of the Imam of the time, right? Each one of them trying at their own time. So what you do if when you study the history of the Ahlul Bayt, actually you're looking at the history of one person basically who lived for 250 something years. If you really want to look at it, you'll see one person, different strategies, different times, one mission and one cause. Okay, so what, they were, what were they trying to do? Actually something which now your enemies are very much working against. Your enemies talk about the idea of political Islam. And they make it seem like a bad thing, right? And then they have terrible people like the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, and they're also talking about the idea of Islamic government, right? So then for you, to even mention Islamic government, when you see those kind of savages, if one wasn't really a mu'min and knows what we're trying to do in the imam, and we know our imam is rahmatan lil alameen, right? That's what our imam is. Savagery, butchery, not thinking, that's something the stooges who've been created by the enemies, the things they do. What we're talking about is about saving the vast majority of mankind. So how does that relate to us? When we look in the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, we understand a couple of points. One of the points we understand is that the Ahlul Bayt weren't able to do their mission because they lacked supporters. The mission of God is not one that's going to be done just by mu'jizah and miracles and Allah just thunderbolts. No, it actually is going to be mu'mini who make up their minds to do the right thing, to serve the cause, and to follow. Now what used to happen was that God would find ways of testing people and seeing who's going to stand firm and tests. He didn't make it easy. God always will throw little tests in, and you'll see who can support Haq even in these times. Let me give you an example. They say that when um, you've heard of the Samiri and the in the Holy Quran, who went and made that cow that could move, right? And he tricked the Bani Israel. Okay, they're explaining how did that happen? Because the cow that they created, let's say out of that jewelry, it could move, it could make a sound. So how could it make that sound? And Musa was speaking to God and he said, that was from me, I made it, but how? They said what happened was, Pharaoh and his army were about to chase Musa and his companions. They're coming over and then they come to the sea. And when they come to the sea, the sea opens, right? The ocean parts and Musa and the people run in. Pharaoh and his army hesitated. They didn't want to go inside. What happened? Jibra'il came on a horse and his horse went in before the army of Pharaoh. And when that horse went in, then Pharaoh's horse saw that, and then he went in, and then everybody went in. So the somebody's watching this. He says that when Musa's uh, horse was walking, each place that it would step, the grounds would quiver under the footsteps of the horse. So he went in, he got that clay, that dirt, and he put that inside the cow, and then that made the cow be able to move. Right? So that made the test much more difficult. If you just have a cow that's made out of gold, it's not as big of a test. But if you have a cow that's actually moving and then you say, this is a god. Okay. So now in our own example, let's bring it back up to modern times. With the Ahlul Bayt, we learn from our hadith that each one of them, they say, was either killed or poisoned. All of the Ahlul Bayt. Right? Let me read you the hadith. It says, مَا minna illa maqtulun aw masmum." Either maktul, we've been killed, karbala, these kind of things, or masmum, poison. What was the deciding factor and what went wrong? What was the difference maker? The presence of the mu'mineen. If the mu'mineen were there and could help and support, the cause would continue. If they wanted to see that there wouldn't be the rule of the ta'ut, 
They wanted to see divine rule and were willing to support, then you can have it. So now the test comes in. Brothers and sisters, are we talking about a distant future? A distant, distant future. Some people, the way when you talk to them about the coming of the Imam, they think of the 313. Are the 313 here? What are the mojizas? What are the signs, right? But they fail to look at their own practical responsibility. There's a way of me seeing right now, do I accept the wilaya of the Imam of the time right now? Do I go, one simple way, do I obey the fatwa of my marja? Simple. That's the reorders of my Imam right now. If somebody goes against my marja, that should, that should be going against my imam. I should be, listen, okay? Now, what happens now is this. You're also in a time, right, where God's made it a little bit more difficult for you. On one side, you've got takfiri elements. You got to be careful about. On the other side, sometimes you have people who are also Shia, also Shia, also maybe wearing the amama and qaba and they're pushing the wrong message. How can I be somebody? The moment is clever. The moment's ready to serve. Who can recognize the truth? And when I see even a mu'min, even a scholar, going against the message, because we as mu'mineen, we've learned, the Khawarij used to put the Qur'an on a spear and fight the Qur'an, which is not it. Let's say somebody uses fadail of Ahlul Bayt, the way of Ahlul Bayt, and also wants to fight against the cause. How can I recognize what's haq and what's batil? Okay? The Imam tells us we have to have three characteristics, and then I want to say how a middle mu'mini makes it a little bit more tough. How can I recognize? He says in times of difficulty. Okay? He says sometimes, right now in, this, in the hadith, he says, you're fighting people and they're going to the, praying to the same qibla like you. You're praying to the qibla, they're praying to the qibla. Okay? How do you recognize what's haq, what's batil? He says you have to have three traits. One of them, the Imam says, is basira, basar, right? Be able to have insight, to be able to see deeply what's hot, what's bottle, what's right, what's wrong. Mu'mineen who think, one. What else? Sabr and patience, right? Sometimes when a mu'min wants to stand for God, people may say things. People may not understand. People might not be able to see the bigger picture of the plan. You might say things, even good people. They're not, we don't think everybody's an enemy. No, many times I don't understand. Do we have that patience to deal with that? To keep saying the right things, keep doing the right things. The other thing the Imam says that we need, he says we have to have ilm bimawaqi al haq. Know the positions of haq. What's right, what's wrong. Who are the enemies of Islam, the major enemies? Who are the friends? Be able to be able to identify these things. Now the part where it gets a little bit tough. A little bit tough. The way that gets a little bit tough is this. The Ahlul Bayt expect you and I, in this time before the Imam arrives, in the time before the Imam arrives, they expect you and I to be able to identify what haq is, to have that insight, to be able to tell, even if both people are preaching the message of Islam, to be able to differentiate and to support. But they don't, they're not satisfied with the only kind of support we offer is support that's found inside my heart. Deep inside my heart, I love Amir al-Mu'mineen. Deep inside my heart, I love Karbala and the mission and the cause. The Ahlul Bayt want to see something else. In the time of the Ghaiba, we have to speak up, brothers and sisters. If we see something that's right, if we see something that's wrong, the tough thing is not just to have this love inside my heart and I want... Sometimes I see what's right and wrong, but then I don't speak up for whatever reason. I don't offer my support. You want to hear a scary hadith from Ali alayhi salam? He says, when it comes to this haq and batil and supporting and, and defending, right? Defending. What happens? He says, As-sakitu akhurradhi. The person who's silent is the brother of the person who's pleased. Okay? Remember that ziyara that we recite where we say that the curse of Allah be on the person who hears and then radiyat bi. Right? There's some people who also, they hear what haqq is, and they, but they're happy, they're okay, they like what's going on. I wasn't actually participating in the battle fighting against Imam Hussein, but I was pleased with that. 
Okay, so that's one level which is definitely terrible. But then there's some people, no, I'm not pleased, but I won't speak up. I won't de de defend haq. I won't support in an appropriate way. Does it mean I have to get loud and emotional? No, but speak up. When I see a decision, this to say the right thing. So what happens is, he says that the person who's silent is the brother of the person who's pleased. What else? He says, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَكُمْ مَعَنَا كَانَ عَلَيْنَا And the person who's not with us, the person who doesn't support us, right? So haq is here and batil is here. I'm not haq, I'm not batil. They said once this Iranian, this Iranian professor he was giving a lecture. Right? And he said something, and then somebody uh, agreed with him. Right? They said, so he said, Barakallah Feek, excellent. Right? Your opinion, you, you agreeing, for instance, with what I have to say, excellent. Then after that, somebody else said the opposite, the exact opposite of what he said. Right? They did. Right? He said, Barakallah Feek, to you also. Right? So the person who supports what I have to say, the person who goes the exact opposite, Barakallah Fiqh. So then a third person is over there. They said, look, you just praised this first person for saying a certain statement. Another person said the exact opposite statement. You praised him also. How can you, they're both diametrically opposed. He said, Barakallah Fiqh to you also. So can we be like that when it comes to haq and batil? Barakallah Fiqh, right? Or just silent in our own hearts. Support everything, it's all okay. Or do we have to, when we identify what's right and what's wrong, and we say that the mission of the Imam is waiting on us, that we have to have that sabr, have that basar, and also be able to speak out and support what's true, right? When we see these kind of things in the hearts of mu'minin and mu'minat, because remember, even for the, some of the mu'minat, they failed when it came to Kufa, right? And Kufa, when this, the representative of the Imam came into Kufa, and they, if you wanted to show the support to the Imam, you have to um, support that representative. At that time, some of the people started to pull their relatives back. Maybe some of the sisters started to tell their relatives, no, don't get your hands dirty, don't say anything, come back, be safe. Right? So sometimes a person has to speak up as a sister, sometimes a brother, right? We all have to make sure, identify my, what my responsibility is. Of course, does it mean be very angry and loud and aggressive? No. I say it in a nice way, I'm humble, I'm kind, but I speak up. I talk. So, we have to be able to be people like this. Brothers and sisters, Jazakumullah khairan for having me here. This has been a wonderful occasion to actually be able to spend some time with you. I hope that we're able to take some of these lessons that we learn from Quran and Sunnah and apply them to our own practical lives. So Allah accept what was said and heard in his way. And that he make us amongst the true soldiers of the Imam of the time. We ask that he protect all of the mu'mineen, mu'minat, maraja, and especially the leader. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad.